Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Bennett. Um, and thank you again for the invitation uh, to give a talk to the friends of the, the, of the British School at Athens. And I hope um, I'm right in considering myself um, a very good friend of, of the BSA too. Um, now, in the interest of full transparency, uh, I want to make clear that this is not the first time that I have uh, given this talk. Um, the idea of a British ambassador in Greece giving a talk about one of the most distinguished ever Greek ambassadors in Britain uh, came from Ambassador Tassos Krikousis of the Association of the Friends of the Gennadius Library. Uh, it was a great honour to do that in January 2019. And tonight's lecture is an English version of that, which was uh, a text delivered in Greek. Um, so anyone who happened to be uh, in that audience that evening is warned to avoid a rerun. You may want to drop off the session now. Now, the experience of uh, researching and writing my talk uh, back in 2019 on Gennadius uh, was not only um, a great honour, um, but it was a great gift because it gave me the occasion and the opportunity to become acquainted with the life and achievements of um, Yanis Gennadius, who must rank among one of the most extraordinary figures um, of certainly of Greek British diplomacy and perhaps indeed of Western diplomacy in modern times. I didn't know much uh, about him before, just that he was the son of the great Greek teacher and patriot, uh, George Gennadios, um, and that he himself worked hard and consistently for Greek interests in London, um, and that he also delved, as very few non-British did, did do, into British culture and values. Let me get a very splendid picture of him on screen before we go on. There we are, our hero for tonight. Um, I'm not sure I know what the insignia that he's wearing is. Um, probably somebody in the audience will be able to tell me. So, Researching for that talk um, 18 months ago, I, I found a great deal more. Uh, some of the slides you'll see tonight um, from the much more extensive scrapbooks held by the Gennadian are a living illustration of Gennadius's experience, which we gain a marvelous insight into his activities, his priorities, his interests and his tastes. So my special thanks to the uh, Gennadius Library for allowing me to make use of their material in the slideshow tonight. But before I embark on the substance of my talk this evening to such a learned uh, group of friends of the BSA, and uh, despite warning you that my approach tonight will be far from expert or qualified, I do want to emulate the best academic tradition in acknowledging a few sources. Um, so I have been, of course, indebted to the marvellously informative biographical sketch of Gennadius by the former director of the library, the Gennadius Library in Athens, the late Donald Nicol, which was published by the American School here in 1990, and the doctoral thesis of uh, Mariana Christopoulou, um, or Ioannis Gennadius Ke Diamorphosi Tis Ethnikis Politikis Tis Elavos. 1871 to 1980, which was submitted at the um, History and Archaeology Department of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in 2012. And I've also drawn uh, quite extensively on the theme of London of the period um, from Peter Ackroyd's superb and very innovative work, London, the Biography, which was first published by Chateau and Windus in 2000. And finally, in true contemporary style to the numerous but anonymous contributors to Wikipedia and other internet sources, um, and especially for many of the other uh, slides you'll see tonight, uh, which we have attributed where we, where we can to their sources. So a warning to, as a result of the dependence on the latter source, the very last of the four, there may be some inaccuracies in what I say tonight, for which I ask your pardon in advance. I did say I was an amateur. <clears throat> So, ladies and gentlemen, um, 
Gennadius's life and career in extraordinary, is extraordinary for many reasons, but most obviously for its span. So with many spells uh, in the city, on, oh, sorry, out of the city on different diplomatic and other missions of equal interest, I'm sure, but not for this evening's discussion. Nevertheless, he was first and foremost based in London for 70 years. And for a diplomat, his remarkable achievement of being appointed to the Court of St. James numerous times in different roles, for which I think we can identify principally four different terms of office, is very rare, if not unrivaled. Now, I and a number of my predecessors um, here in Athens have been lucky enough to have had two postings to Greece, um, and that's usually the maximum uh, in our system. Um, but you'll see from the frequency of the return, the constancy of interest and connection with the country that my colleagues have maintained, alongside a propensity to retire or buy property here, um, that many of us would love to be in the position to emulate Gennadius in the, in the opposite direction. Of course, his repeated postings to London did not happen by chance. He sought them out actively and on the basis of his familiarity um, and an inculcation into all things British and British culture in his formative years. As uh, Mariana Christopoulou notes, for Gennadius, the connection with Britain and Anglo-Saxon culture more widely started very early on through the American missionary John Hill, uh, co-founder together with his wife Frances of the well-known Hill School here in Athens. Uh, he was sent then along with his brother to the famous Protestant school of Malta. And there he received a broad education, learned English, came in contact with a different cultural and religious environment and acquired, I quote, the knowledge and ability to penetrate into British character and customs. And as uh, Mariana continues, it was his studies and understanding of Britain, which he acquired at the Hill School, which led him to seek employment uh, in Britain at the very tender age of 18, arriving in 1862 and taking up a good position with the trading house of Raleigh Brothers. Uh, and indeed, most ironically, ignoring the wishes of his family uh, that he should pursue a diplomatic career. And that is a picture of the Rallis Brothers headquarters at Harvester House. That building was completed in 1868, so just six years after uh, Rallis arrived in London and started to work for the company. So already by the mid-1840s, mid as uh, Peter Ackroyd notes, London had become the greatest city on earth the capital of empire, the center of international trade and finance, a vast world market into which the world poured. It can feel like that sometimes even today. London in the early 1860s, when Gennadius arrived, the city was still in the state of transition, but on a one-way trajectory to the condition of megalopolis. Um, its Georgian compactness and grace and variety had gone. The dominant style now was neo-Gothic and neoclassical and on a large scale. Um, and it was becoming first and foremost, the city of empire but with public buildings, which reflected that status. Um, as Peter Ackroyd says, the public spaces, the railway termini, uh, the hotels, the great docks, the new thoroughfares, the rebuilt markets, all were visible expression of a city of unrivaled strength and immensity. And as the centre of international finance and the engine of imperial power, as Ackroyd notes, the city teemed with life and expectancy. Uh, so for someone like Gennadius, um, determined on a business career at that stage, he had certainly chosen the right location. And uh, I like to think this, of course, holds, holds true right until today. The City of London still draws in thousands of financial services sector workers from around the world and has proved a fertile land of opportunity for many young professional Greeks as well, still to this day. Um, 150 years later, and particularly, of course, in the, the years of um, 
economic crisis recently. And uh, as, as Peter Ackroyd observes again, the London in the late 19th century was established upon money. It had become the progenitor of commerce and the vehicle of credit throughout the world. Almost one half of the world's merchant shipping was controlled directly or indirectly by the institutions of the city. And over the next decades, there was a huge growth in the scale of commercial activity in the city, the erection of buildings, housing banks and other enterprises, and the numbers employed in commercial and financial activity grew exponentially too. It's been established that the 200,000 thousands working population of London in 1871 had grown to 364,000 40 years later. And Gennadius obviously would have seen and experienced this extraordinary growth firsthand. And the development of London as a global centre of commerce created and shaped a new breed of market actors and workers with whom Gennadius became familiar. Indeed, as uh, Mariana Christopoulou notes, he transcribed an article on this subject from the London Times from this period and kept it in his archive. He referred to city merchants as concentrating on their work, not wasting time. Their words brisk and lively, their zest and shrewdness reflected in their manner and appearance. And we know uh, from his archive and scrapbooks um, other places that he went to. Like every modern traveller, he visited Buckingham Palace, Westminster Abbey, where he encountered the whole history of England, Trafalgar Square, where Nelson's column, of course, symbolised Britain's ruling of the waves in that uh, era, and the British Museum. Uh, of course, he did not fail to visit the British Museum and indeed became a regular user and visitor at the library that you see there. And of course, uh, he viewed there the Parthenon sculptures uh, and became a trenchant and very active critic and lobbyist against the museum's possession of the, of the marbles. I think there can be little doubt that Gennadios' familiarity, contacts and understanding of the workings of the City of London must have played a very important part in the signal and rightly celebrated achievement of his first diplomatic posting to London. If I may put it in contemporary parlance, the restructuring of Greece's outstanding debt to uh, its British creditors, which he negotiated in the late 1870s personally presenting the Greek case to the London Committee of the Stock Exchange. And there you see it in a etching, I think, uh, from that period or engraving from the period. It would certainly be interesting to learn, if, uh, if that were possible, how his negotiating techniques and marketing of the country compared with those of Greek ministers currently and in recent years in their uh, negotiations with creditors and their approaches to the international bond markets. So the resulting settlement and restoration of Greek credit on the London market not only burnished Gennadios's reputation, but ushered in a new era, era of pro-Greek and uh, Philhellenic sentiment in Britain. But uh, we're jumping ahead a bit. Um, what else was Gennadius to encounter in the London of 1862 when he first arrived? The great men of British Victorian political history bestrode the stage. Palmerston was Prime Minister, uh, and that combination of imperial and commercial power centred in London, which um, I just described, would have been very evident to the newly arrived 18-year-old. The new Westminster Bridge opened that year. Joseph Basil Getty began the construction of the Thames Embankment. And the International Exhibition of Industry and Science, or the Great London Exposition, it was called, opened in South Kensington, uh, one in the series of World's Fairs. Um, it is recorded that the appearance of a refrigerator making ice caused a sensation. 
And the huge development of Britain's railway system during this period was symbolised by the first express train forerunner of the Flying Scotsman departing from King's Cross to Edinburgh in May of that year. And there is King's Cross from about that period, still recognisable. Gennady's scrapbooks contain a number of used railway tickets uh, for connections, including between London and Liverpool, uh, the boat train to Southampton, oops, um, and attest to the growing spread and use of the railway network at that time. So Gennady's was not only active, but an activist by uh, nature, uh, as we know from his time in London, during the Villacy, murders episode. Even before he represented his country officially, he was championing its cause and its reputation. And he was able to do so in a climate of growing liberalism. Its values we now commonly expect as the norm began to be established and protected in law. And as Christopher Paulu has noted, um, he began his career in London at a time when the press was liberated uh, through the even partial lifting on of taxation, uh, the extension of franchise, and when free trade was strengthened. And it indeed was Gennady's' overzealous exercise of these freedoms which brought him into conflict with the more conservative commercial instincts of his employers at, uh, at Raleigh Brothers, and led to his break with the company and change in career path to the Greek diplomatic service, which uh, we can only imagine how much that would have delighted his family. So when he took up his first post as first secretary in the Greek legation in 1875, another of those uh, Victorian giants was in office, this time Disraeli. The exponential growth of London and other British cities in this period of industrial revolution and urbanization had caused enormous problems and pressures on housing, on health and social welfare public safety and security. And uh, Ackroyd shares some really remarkable statistics um, with us. By 1870, the sheer quantity of life in the city uh, was overwhelming. Every eight minutes of every day of every year, someone died in London. Every five minutes, someone was born. There were 40,000 costermongers and 100,000 winter tramps, the then homeless. There were more Irish living in London than in Dublin and more Catholics than in Rome. There were 20,000 public houses visited by uh, 500,000 customers. Eight years later, there were more than half a million dwellings, more than sufficient for one continuous row of buildings around the island of Great Britain. So no wonder that Disraeli, the, the archetypal two nations or reforming conservatives sought to do something about the negative social consequences and human misery caused by this unprecedented level of congestion and crowding. And in 1875, the Public Health Act established a code of practice for sanitation across the country. Basil Getty, again, completed the 30 year construction of London's London sewer system, structure is still in use today, as you know. And another act of parliament was passed to permit slum clearance. Back to Gennadius. A few years after this, in 1879, uh, the time of his triumph with the Greek loan, he instigated the formation of the Greek Committee in London, at least that first, uh, that version of the Greek Committee in London a move which was to help shape British policy towards Greece in many international uh, developments in the decades to come. The conservative Disraeli was still in office, but his arch political opponent uh, from the opposition, the liberal giant Gladstone, uh, had just published his essay, Greece and the Treaty of Berlin, uh, supportive of Greece's interests. One can only speculate whether that sympathy arose from his very brief time between November 1858 and uh, February 1859, when on behalf of Lord Derby's government, Gladstone was made extraordinary Lord High Commissioner of the Ionian Islands, 
with a mandate to tackle challenges over the future administration of the protectorate. And there is the Spianada uh, in Corfu town from, we think, a little earlier, pro probably from the um, 1840s. And that is a painting by Joseph Scrantz, which is in the residence of the British Embassy here in Athens. And we're very proud of it. It's a, one of a pair. And the committee's first president, the, uh, the Greek committee, was one of Gladstone's closest confidants and collaborators, Lord Rosebery. Um, indeed, it was in 1879 that he first came to national attention by masterminding the successful, very famous Midlothian campaign of Gladstone, pioneering election techniques to correct, connect directly with voters, such as town hall meetings and speeches from the hustings. It all started then. Gennadius was recalled shortly after this period, but swiftly returned to London in 1881, this time as Chargé d'Affaires. And uh, Greece's great supporter, Gladstone, uh, was now in office. The Boer War was coming to a climax. Britain's rapid urbanisation was evident in the census of that year, which showed that two thirds of the population of Britain lived in cities and one seventh in London. Probably not very different today, I think, those um, proportions. The expansion of the press continued with the first publication of the London Evening News and The People. And London's love affair that we saw with the, uh, the Great Exposition, the love affair and genius for the public understanding of science and learning, continued with the opening of the Natural History Museum in Albertopolis in South Kensington. There it is, as it looks still today. And a major development in British popular culture of truly, to my mind, global significance, the Savoy Theatre opened in London. Yes, now this was notable as the first public building to be entirely lit by electricity, but also as the permanent home of the Doily Cart Opera Company, and the amazingly successful run of Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. We know from the scrapbooks that uh, Gennadius was throughout his life in London an eager theatre and uh, opera goer. Uh, this is a, a bill from a performance called, most appropriately, The Siege of Missolonghi, or The Massacre of the Greeks. But that was performed in London. Uh, he visited the Alhambra, the uh, Garrick, the Lyric and Covent Garden, um, among others, as you can see from the, these tickets, which he very touchingly kept. So um, I can't believe that as a resident of London for so many decades in that period, and somebody so imbued in British culture, he would not have also experienced Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, though, like British pantomime, these can be a form of British entertainment, which even a foreigner as admiring of our culture as Gennadius may have struggled to comprehend and enjoy. So they are a very British taste. After another interval, Gennadius was again made charge in 1885 and then achieved his ambition of appointment as minister resident a year later. And there followed, a few years after that, the second of his great contributions to the prosperity of Greece, the lowering of current duty paid in the UK. And this really was of enormous significance. The 19th century had seen a huge increase in Western European consumption of Mediterranean fruits and consequent demand for Greek currants. Britain was the main current importing country, reflecting an increasing consumption of puddings, uh, sweet desserts made with sugar and dried fruits. And uh, there is the most famous version of, of uh, such a pudding, a Christmas pudding. Pudding consumption rose in Britain among the lower and middle classes as Greek current and Greek currents benefited uh, from this general trend. Total current consumption in England rose from 14,000 tons in 1844 to 46,000 tons in 1874. 
and puddings became a sign of abundance and of the happiness of the bourgeois family. Greek currants became an essential ingredient in the aspirations of the upwardly mobile British uh, family. Christmas pudding, a mainstay of the season, but other puddings as well, popular as year-round favorites. A mid-century recipe for the mysteriously named, to the non-British, spotted dick, a sponge-type pudding studded with dried fruit. There is uh, a fine example calls for Smyrna raisins or sultanas to create the spots. So because of this growing demand from Britain, the traditional current growing regions around the Gulf of Corinth, as we know, the word current is a uh, corruption of Corinth, and the nearby Ionian Islands all started to become more specialized in current cultivation, abandoning other agricultural activities and relying instead on British pudding eaters for their subsistence. So, Gennadius' su success in persuading Her Majesty's Treasury to lower the duty from seven shillings to two shillings per hundredweight rightly earned him the gratitude of the Greek business community right across Britain and contributed to his appointment in 1890 to Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary in London. And to bring us up to date again, I was delighted to learn uh, quite recently that Britain is still one of the leading consumers and importers of Greek currents. And the region of Corinthia is still a major supplier to the British market of both fresh and dried grapes. So in the late 1880s, um, London was consuming puddings of all kinds and in vast quantities all around Cannabis. I'm not sure if these rather heavy, though delicious and nutritious foodstuffs were to his taste. A glance at some of the menus he saved from uh, dinners at the many clubs and restaurants he frequented in London suggests he may have developed rather a more refined and eclectic palate. Some extraordinary uh, menus uh, form part of the scrapbooks. This is from the Florence restaurant. Uh, another one, the Queen's Hotel. Um, they're well worth a study to see what, you see what people got through in one, in one dinner sitting in those days. Um, and this is from the Reform Club. Um, that dinner includes fresh caviar, a wild duck salad with orange, sole filet, Lamb, cuts, lamb cutlets and rissolets with chicken. So not much, not much room for British pudding with Greek currants there, we hope. Now, after his recall and resignation in 1892, Gennadius did not take up the diplomatic post again in London until 1910. But these were far from wilderness years and he remained active in many different clubs and societies both connected with Greece and Greek culture and not. And his erudition and uh, achievements were recognized uh, in British universities and uh, many other um, institutions. His reputation was firmly enough entrenched with the establishment in Britain that he was invited to dine with Queen Victoria at Windsor in 1893. I don't have the menu for that occasion, unfortunately. Um, but the impact on his income of um, stepping out of uh, diplomatic life forced him to put into storage and divest himself of part of the immense library that he'd built up over the intervening years, uh, alongside successive moves of house to different parts of London. And in 1902, during this period, he of course got married to Florence or Anthe, a more, a new and more serene phase of his life um, and crowned by his appointment finally as ambassador to the court of St. James in 1910. There is uh, Florence or Anthe as she was known, Gennadius. So the span of his life in London was already now approaching 50 years and um, the changes in that period were enormous. Um, the Victorian era had, had ended nine years earlier and uh, reflecting his great interest in royal matters, in his scrapbook, uh, he kept a postcard of Queen Victoria's 
funeral procession and you can see uh, I'm pretty sure that's Edward VII in the middle there. Um, the scale and, uh, uh, excuse me, in 1911 as ambassador he played a direct role in a great British state occasion organising the visit of members of the Greek royal family who attended George V's coronation uh, and with Florence uh, entertaining them in London. And the scale and style of the coronation uh, reflected the continuing sense of imperial greatness uh, at its zenith, indeed. Um, let me share a few details because I'm sure um, Gennadius would have enjoyed and appreciated them. The first procession to the Abbey consisted of representatives of foreign royal families and governments carried in 14 carriages. The second procession had five state landors for members of the British royal family. The fifth contained the king and queen's children. The third brought the officers of state in a further four carriages. And the 25th and final carriage, the gold state coach, carrying the king and queen. They were surrounded by equerries, aides de camp, commanders of the armed forces mounted on horseback, all escorted by yeomen of the guard, colonial and Indian cavalry, and the royal horse guards. Some 45,000 soldiers and sailors from across the empire either participated in the procession or lined the route. And in an unexpected innovation, uh, the appearance of the king and queen on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. This created such excitement that the soldiers outside the palace broke ranks and joined in the cheering. That evening, the principal buildings in central London were illuminated with strings of electric lights until 12.30 a.m. And on the following day, the return possession was reconstituted for a further parade through the streets of the capital, this time passing along the Strand, City of London, St Paul's Cathedral, River Thames, London Bridge, Borough High Street, Westminster Bridge, finally returning up the Mall to Buckingham Palace. And this time, 55,000 troops were on duty. That was possibly London's grandest moment at the acme of the imperial era. But British politics was moving into a very different phase. In 1909 to 1910, uh, Lloyd George, Greece's great champion uh, in British politics of the period, struggled to pass his people's budget, which was described as revolutionary, because it was the first budget with the expressed intention of redistributing wealth more equally among the British population. It introduced unprecedented taxes on the lands and incomes of the wealthy to fund new social welfare programs. And of course, by targeting the landed and wealthy, met significant opposition in the House of Lords, leading to a constitutional standoff, only finally resolved by the Parliament Act of 1911, which limited the power of the peers to block significant legislation. That was 1911, the immediately following six years and the final ones of Gennadius's diplomatic career in London must have been his most professionally challenging as Greece was embroiled in the two Balkan wars of 1912 to 13, which proved to be so decisive for the further expansion of the modern Greek state. And in particular, uh, his role was to support Venizelos and the rest of the Greek delegation, which of course included Metaxas, um, at the London Conference uh, of July. That must really have been an all-consuming and peak diplomatic experience. And there is a photograph of the um, uh, heads of a number of the delegations, uh, Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and um, yeah, two from Montenegro there. Venezuelos in the, in the middle, as you see. And the role of the great powers, of course, including Britain and its political leaders at the time, Asquith and Lord Grey, who chaired the conference at St. James's Palace, was, of course, decisive. And the political, social, communal and personal conflicts and tensions that erupted during those years among the Balkan states uh, as the slow death of the Ottoman Empire uh, neared, its, neared its climax, that did not go without notice among non-diplomatic uh, and political circles in Britain either. Just two years after the end of the Second Balkan War, John Buchan 
published his now world famous novel, The 39 Steps. And that is a picture of um, a first edition. Uh, and it centered around the plot to kill fictional Greek Prime Minister Karolides in Britain. Um, Buchan does very little, does not attempt to conceal that his character is based on Venizelos himself. Uh, but two years before, an anonymous Greek author anticipated Buchan in a fictionalized depiction of London, as a, also as a location for the violent settlement of Balkan conflicts. Uh, but he had no such compunction about hiding the identity of the uh, chief protagonist. Uh, and this was a serialized novella entitled Sherlock Holmes, The Savior of Venizelos. It appeared in the weekly magazine Elas in 25 installments between uh, December 1913 and March 1914. Uh, and in contrast to Buchan's version, Venizelos escapes an assassination attempt by Balkan enemies, but through the intervention of the great Holmes. And there is a picture of uh, my well-thumbed uh, copy of that extraordinary work. Um, as far as I know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle never instituted any proceedings against Elas for violations against copyright. Um, uh, perhaps he hadn't branded Sherlock Holmes officially, um, or perhaps he never knew of the impertinent uh, Greek author's work. But the fact that this unknown Greek author chose to plagiarize Conan Doyle in this way does attest to the extraordinary popularity of the Holmes phenomenon, which in its own lifespan parallels and rivals, but does not beat Gennadius's long career in London. After the first story was published in 1887, his character's popularity became widespread. 56 short stories, four novels in total, appearing on and off from then until 1927. Um, all but one are set in the Victorian or Edwardian eras between about 1880 and 1914. And a great deal of the action takes place in London across different locations, milieu, social strata. I personally have since childhood have been an absolute devotee of the oeuvre. And I seriously would go so far as to say that keen students of London of this period could do much worse than studying these stories to get a sense of the economic, social and political life in the London of Gennadius's time or of a big chunk of Gennadius's time. I do wonder if he read them himself. Um, there is one short story called The Greek Interpreter. Um, perhaps it was a Greek of his acquaintance in the London community who was responsible for uh, the extraordinary work about Venizelos or who inspired somebody to produce it, but it seems we will never know. Um, and by the way, Sherlock Holmes, The Saviour of Venizelos was re reprinted by Agra 100 years later in 2013 and available in bookstores today. Now, to return to the realm of reality and a more sober note, the following year, of course, saw the outbreak of World War I, conflict which not only transformed Britain, uh, but had profound impacts on Greece to ushering in the national schism. Gennadius's relationship with Venizelos led to his resignation in 1917, uh, uh, when Venizelos himself, the rift with, um, the, with the king, took place, but he was reappointed as ambassador when Venizelos then became prime minister a few months later. Uh, he might have been, must have been completely absorbed by political developments back home at the period, but cannot have been oblivious to the course of the war as it affected London directly as well. And uh, back to Peter Ackroyd, he notes that despite its impacts on Britain, the Great War did not impede the city's growth or its essential vitality. Um, and the Prime Minister at the time, Asquith, commented on the enthusiastic reaction of the crowds on the outbreak of war in August uh, 1914, that war or anything that seems likely to lead to war is always popular with the London mob. And London did indeed seem to thrive from war. The city continued to expand. The war economy meant full employment, and as a result, the standard of living improved. Uh, Ackroyd notes, 
Of course, there were local hazards and difficulties. Building work was suspended, and at night the city was only partly illuminated by lamps which had been painted dark blue as a precaution against the raids of Zeppelin warships. Parks and squares were used uh, as kitchen gardens, while hotels became government offices or hostels. But there were more foreign restaurants and patisseries than ever as a result of the presence of emigres, while the dance halls and music, music halls were full. So we can imagine that Gennady's tastes for entertainment and pleasure continued to be met, even in the thick of wartime. And four years later, with the armistice, and there is a photograph uh, of the crowds in London, London's uh, propensity, uh, still more than evident today, to express itself on the streets reached a peak. Stanley uh, Weintraub wrote of uh, central London at that moment. You can see it here. The street was now a seething mass of humanity. Flags appeared as if by magic. Streams of men and women flowed from the embankment. Almost before the last strike of the clock had died away, the strict, war-straightened, regulated streets of London had become a triumphant pandemonium. So 1918 was a milestone for, for Gennadius personally too, with his final retirement from uh, at least official diplomatic life. And it also saw the culmination of one of his most cherished projects, the founding of the Corais Chair at King's College, um, which celebrated its centenary and re-endowment uh, last year. He would have been thrilled and enormously proud, I think. Um, sorry, just checking my slides. But of course, even at that period, he was far from inactive. Uh, in 1920, he accompanied uh, Venizelos, who had also, of course, been a great supporter of the Corais effort on his visit to London. And I'm sure that he must have had many contacts with him when he came and went during his exile uh, from Greece in 1921. And Gennadius, having presided over one great philanthropic contribution to the intellectual capital of Britain, uh, the Correus Chair, uh, he intensified his efforts to make a corresponding intellectual legacy to the land of his birth, the bequest of his remarkable library. And that is uh, the, um, the label, the ex libris label of the collection of Yanis and uh, Anthe Gennadius, which I presume would have appeared uh, in all those volumes he collected. And he managed this effort absolutely supremely through the support and patronage of friends in the United States, including uh, George Washington University, uh, the American School of Classical Studies, and the Carnegie Corporation. And as um, I think most of you will all well know, the management committee of the British School at Athens were put off uh, back in the, as far back as in the 1880s, uh, long before this actually happened, from taking up Gennadius's initial offer, uh, put off by the scale of the likely costs of the project. Um, so I'll leave to Professor ben Bennett and maybe other council members with us tonight to comment later on whether that missed opportunity by their predecessors might rankle just a little bit still today, especially when we look at that building. Um, just next door. And there is uh, the same building, the photograph of the period with um, Yanis and uh, Anthe Gennadius uh, stepping down the path. In 1922, the year uh, Gennadius clinched the deal in the United States, um, it was of course momentous and tragic for Greece. Uh, back in London, it was, for very different reasons, also a defining moment in British politics uh, with the collapse of the First World War coalition led by Lord George. The resulting election of 1922 defined British politics for two generations. The Conservatives dominated government for 42 subsequent years and the Liberal Party was essentially consigned to the also-ran third party status it does still have today. I don't think I'm saying anything politically controversial there. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, also in 1922, the British Empire reached its peak extent, covering a quarter of the world and ruling over uh, one in four people on Earth. But the modern era was well on its way, with London, of course, as its hub, and it was in particular a seminal year for broadcasting. The BBC was formed and began radio broadcasts from London, uh, and a license fee was imposed for the first time. Extraordinary, still with us today. Um, that is the original, uh, rather lovely uh, BBC logo. Uh, and uh, the following year, Gennadius and Florence uh, followed the trends, uh, from the trend of hundreds of thousands of their fellow Londoners by moving out of the center to the surrounding country or suburbs, making their final home um, in what is now Greater London, White Gates in East Moseley near Hampton Court. There is a picture of the extremely splendid uh, interior. And this was the peak period of suburbanization of London, uh, which began as early as the 1850s when the influx of new industrial uh, workers to London required builders to reach ever outward from the small compact center to house them. The spread of the railway and underground network facilitated this, making commuting easy and workmen's fares affordable. The trend continued through the next decades with housing development reaching out to areas such as Canonbury, Walworth, Tottenham, East Ham, Walthamstow, more genteel areas such as St John's Wood, Hampstead Garden uh, suburb and Crouch End. Gennadius and Florence went even further afield as West Moseley uh, was at that time effectively countryside, but uh, the space there, as in so many other villages around London, was rapidly filled in um, by, in many areas, a row upon row of terraced red brick houses and workers' cottages. Uh, others, uh, such as the belt furthest away from the centre, were characterised by grand villas with large gardens. Those in the west of London, near to Gennadius's new home, were considered the most superior and you can see that from the um, dimensions of uh, the interior of the house. Of course suburban London with its connotations for cultural and social sterility and conformism came to be denigrated and mocked um, in the 1930s when um, two and a half million people were said to be on the move every day in and out of the centre of London to the suburbs uh, and that suburbanisation reached its apogee, the phenomenon became the subject of the withering scorn and contempt of John Betjeman, W.H. Auden, and many others. But I'm sure that the civility and security and fresh air of leafy East Moseley would have been entirely right and appropriate for Florence and Ioannis Gennadius in, uh, in his declining years. His new location would have afforded him comfort, tranquility and stability after so many frequent changes of address in the bustling centre, but also afforded easy access to his beloved clubs and societies, restaurants, theatres, museums and libraries. And when he died there in 1932, London was seeing yet more innovation, improvement, development and change. It really was the beginning of a new era in many different ways. Some of those Gennadius would have approved of and enjoyed, for example, the establishment by Thomas Beecham of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, George V was not only busy opening the new Lambeth Bridge, giving easier access across the Thames to those uh, who lived on the south side, um, but as a devotee of the British uh, royal family, which had honoured him many times, he surely would have appreciated the monarch's first uh, royal Christmas broadcast. And there is George V uh, giving it. Um, I think I've divined as a natural conservative by character, however, he wouldn't have approved of the Times of London changing its typeface that year. And he might have been skeptical about the first television broadcast by the BBC, which also happened then. More ominously, it was the year in which Oswald Mosley founded the British Union of Fascists with all that uh, implied for the course of the next decade across Europe. Um, 
I think we can be glad, perhaps, that Gennavius was spared that and the impacts which the resulting war and occupation had on his country of birth and the city and his city of adoption. His long life and extraordinary career with one foot in Greece and the other in London had seen quite enough change and tumult for one lifetime. And it is our great privilege that amid all of that, he found the energy and inspiration to leave such an inspiring legacy to scholarship and cultural exchange to both countries. Uh, so to conclude, I refer you to um, two comments on Gennavius by publications of the time, one Greek and one British, uh, both of which I'm sure Gennavius was a, a keen reader, if not subscriber of. Um, These are comments, uh, obituary comments, after his death in uh, September 1932. The wide circulation uh, Estia newspaper in Greece announced Gennadius's death, uh, pointing out that he was the very model of a fiery Greek patriot with a full and varied education. Ioannis Gennadius served Greece in the gentle mode of nobleman of moral and spirit and proved himself worthy of her. And a few days later on uh, 17 September, uh, 1932, the London Times published an obituary for Gennadius, written by the hymn writer and professor of philology at Oxford, Athelstan Riley, who said, his obvious success as his country's representative at the court of St. James was not only due to his knowledge of England and its ways, but to his identification with the English spirit. Speaking with him was just like speaking with an Englishman. It was difficult to believe that this Orthodox Greek was not an Anglican Englishman. So to conclude, I'd like to think uh, that, that I'm someone who, like so many of my predecessors, much more distinguished predecessors uh, in this role, tries to continue in in that Gennadius tradition, uh, of diplomats who work, of course, first and foremost for their country, but do so more effectively uh, because of the love and admiration they have for the country to which they are accredited. Thank you.